as it should be, you know, because there is a thing called the life cycle, and I'm dangling at the end of it with about a half dozen diseases that come with elderly people. And the lectures, if you want to call them that, or the seminar that we'll have, is probably going to be the last I may be able to do, uh, which is natural, you know. A baby suddenly cries out, Mama and Dada, and you say, Ah, oh, it's beginning to talk, you know. A life cycle has begun. It can communicate with more than a yow. Well, in my case, it's another way around. You start saying, ba ba, 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 and that's the <laughs> end. <laughs> Shut up. But uh, the value I may have for you is that having lived 81 plus six months going into seven uh, on this planet, I have covered a period from 19, early 1921, January 1921, when people like Lenin, Trotsky, if you're familiar with all of these names, I don't know. Uh, I won't mention Stalin, I believe he's beneath contempt. And all kinds of big Bill Haywards and Emma Goldman, so these are names I'm sure you're somewhat familiar with. And in point of fact, Kropotkin died about uh, 10 days after I was born. <laughs> so even he was around, you know, although not very active. And the Russian Revolution was still going on in 1921. So I was born into all of that, but not simply as a newspaper reader. I was born into all of that as close to a participant that an American could be, short of going, you know, at the age of three to visit Lenin's beer when he died in 1924, or short of, you know, this and that, a few other things. You know what I'm saying? Am I making sense to you? If I'm not making sense to you, because I sometimes talk a little tangentially, I like to approach things from an angle, <coughs> It's often more illuminating in the end. But uh, if I'm not making sense to you, I beg you to please interrupt me. I've already begun to sp you know, spill out all my energy, so I'd better slow up. And uh, owing to the limitations, physical limitations that I'm faced with, the first thing I hope you'll be able to contend with is the fact that I have to slow down for a moment take it easy and let other people t do the talking because your breath leaves you very rapidly at this age, you know. It just suddenly you begin to find that you're having trouble breathing and you have to slow up. But the most important thing about the fact that I'm 81 for your purposes is that I spent almost every conscious moment of these years, let's say give or take about 75, close to 80. I spent them in revolutionary organizations. I belonged to all kinds. I was always an activist. I never held theories that were strictly academic, you know. And even though I became a professor in a state college out in New Jersey and lectured in all the, some of the really hotshot colleges in the, in the United States, in Europe, and in uh, and Canada, so on and so forth, and got around all over the place. Even though I did all of that and was engaged in the theoretical development of the left, however minimally, I uh, was always trying to put my theories into practice. So I always belonged to something. You know, when I was nine years old, I belonged to the Young Pioneers of America. Does that mean anything to any of you here? You, do you know what it means? Yeah. What? The well, Young Pioneers was the youth organization. The, the children's organization. Right. They had a youth organization. <laughs> well, I got in at the age of nine. That meant I got in around 1930. 
And uh, you have no idea what kids, even at the age of nine, can learn if you give them a real feast and give them every opportunity in their own way and under very careful guidance to pick up a lot. So I was very politically and socially and even personally very self-conscious of what was going on in 1930. I so clearly remember Hitler's rise to power, you know. I so clearly remember the Great Depression because it took place in 1929 and I was there and I saw it in a real physical sense. It hit my family very badly. In short, we were shoved out in the streets with furniture and all that, you know, couldn't pay rent and had to store our things and live in boarding houses. And also, I had to go to work at a very young age, even though I went to school. I sold ice cream, I sold newspapers. It was a day when they had newspaper boys. And I sold the Daily Worker and made a dollar a day, which was a hell of a lot, because on a dollar a day, you could live with your a whole family. Funny as it seems to you now, it was very real then. We even had silver dollars around. For the sake of it, for the mere hell of it, I bought one <laughs> some time ago just to bring me back to the good old days, you know, when the West was still wild <laughs> and we called Indians or Native Americans engines. I was feeling it for it, and I don't have it on me. And I acquired a completely left wing education, so much so. Uh, even in public school, now in public school in those days, they really gave you an education. It was almost equivalent to a BA. We'd studied the French Revolution, and the teacher would hand the class over to me and say, you're going to take it over anyway. So go ahead, books, and tell us all about Jean-Paul Marat, or Rousseau, or Robespierre. Are these names familiar to you? I don't know whether they are sometimes or not not to you specifically, but to whoever I'm talking to nowadays. I know doctors who don't even know who Louis Pasteur is, so you see what a problem that is? <laughs> That's the way education works today. And I took over the class and I defended Pasteur, or I defended John Brown, you know, shortly before the outbreak of the Civil War. Because in those days, the textbooks used to defame him. They used to call him a madman, insane, crazed, all that. It was as though the Confederacy got hold of the whole culture, despite the fact that the North won the Civil War, whatever that meant. And the blacks partly lost it. So uh, I went through that whole experience of the Depression, and then the great moments in my life were the revolutions that broke out. One of the most important attempts that I thought, now in retrospect that I think, is hardly known, but is one of the most deserving to be known, is the revolution of the Austrian workers in Vienna in 1934. Did any of you ever see the movie Julia? Yes. Did you give me a show of hands? Well, there's a scene with Jane Fonda when she runs to Vienna to meet Vanessa Redgrave, who's gone to Vienna to study with Freud and to study with the uh, Austrian Socialist Party. And you see workers with their hands on their heads, you know, who are prisoners and being escorted by bayoneted armed Austrian soldiers, the Heimwehr, and that was the time when the Austrian workers rose up for a whole week and fought to make a revolution in part and to prevent fascism from coming to Austria. And there they had a marvelous movement and they had a marvelous body of ideas which I was very delighted resembled things that I have been propounding recently in the name of libertarian municipalism. And this was an attempt to form confederations of municipalities in Austria under a red flag and build a socialist Austria 
but was very democratic and still based on localities, you know, in confederal relations. So I remember that, and then I remember the uprising the same year of the workers in northern Spain, the miners, the Asturian workers. Are any of you familiar with that? Can I ask? Please do not be ashamed or embarrassed about this. I would be surprised if they taught you who Franklin D. Roosevelt was. <laughs> really, the ignorance today in the schools uh, is, is appalling to me, my generation anyway. But do any of you know who the Asturian miners were, the Dinamateros, those who wore dynamite belts around their waist and threw themselves against Francisco Franco's tanks? They did. Suicide bombing is not a Middle Eastern, you know, discovery. It went on as far back, to my recollection, as the Spanish Civil War. And, of course, there was the Spanish Revolution and the Spanish Civil War, and ultimately it was that war that made me into a Trotskyist. I supported the Poon, ultimately, the detachment. Did any of you read Farewell to Catalonia, Homage to Catalonia? May I see one? I beg you to read that book. It's a page turner as a book. I mean, it's far better than any, shall we say, however well-intentioned novel that comes out today that presumes to be left-wing. So, it's incredible. In fact, I bought a reading of the uh, Homage to Catalonia just for my own sake, so that I could lie in bed and rest and listen to this book over and over and over again. It's not well placed. There's a good deal that is misleading, but... Orwell, George Orwell, how many of you know George Orwell? Thank you all, I'm glad to see that. It's a good thing he wrote The Animal Farm and uh, 1984. Who was a, I don't remember which year barbarism existed. It began so early in my life. So uh, George Orwell, who fought in Spain as militiamen, fought in an organization called the Partida Marxista, the Unificación, uh, oh no, I got it wrong, Partida Abrero, the Unificación Marxista, or the Workers' Party of Marxist Unification which I was most sympathetic to at that time. I knew very little about Spanish anarchism. I no idea how uh, there was an almost uh, conspiracy of silence to keep Spanish anarcho syndicalists, which is what they really should be called. There were very few of them were anarchists, they were syndicalists. But that requires an explanation, I suspect, which I'm more than willing to give. And so I had the opportunity to go all through that and became a Trotskyist for a while and then broke with that and became a libertarian socialist. And finally I became my version of an anarchist. Now let me make that very plain to you. The anarchism that you have been hearing is a version which is an attempt to meld the best features, bring together, blend the best features of Marxism Views. I won't say Marxism because Marxists are very rare. Marx used to complain. He made the statement before he died, I'm no Marxist. <laughs> oh, really, so je ne suis pas un Marxiste. I'm no Marxist. And uh, he did that because so many people who called themselves Marxists, he thought, did not properly represent this point of view. And then ultimately, I began to find out that when I had to deal with anarchism, uh, I had to confront a form of individualism. This is reflected in the writings of people like uh, John Zerzan. Have you ever heard of that man? He got a slot on 60 Minutes, I hear. It should really make him a celebrated individual. And uh, he seems to be, I don't know him personally. I talked to him once over the phone. But people have reported to me, and you can take it for what it's worth, that he does seems to be, his marbles seem to be fairly scattered. 
And when a reporter interviewed him uh, and found the television set there, you know, he's against technology of any kind. He's against conversation because it's symbolic reification. Though the, does a word like symbolic reification make sense to you, you know? I hope so. Anyway, the idea basically that words begin to dominate you instead of you controlling the words, you know? There's a truth to that, of course, but it isn't the whole story. <laughs> and for him, it practically is. So he doesn't believe in speaking in principle, although he's very unconversational and conversational. That is to say, he's incoherent. Hmm. And uh, he had a television set there, and when the reporter said, what are you doing with a television set? You're supposed to be going around together with Kirkpatrick Sale and an axe, smashing them up. He went on to say, well, you know, you've got to go with the flow. <laughs> And I didn't think that that was very anarchistic or revolutionary. Now, I'm telling you all of these things for a special reason. What I would like to do in the limited time that I have, and it's now going into an hour and a half, is to devote a certain amount of time to presenting the history of the left rather presumptuously as I perceived it in my life. There are very few people who spent 70 years on the left, and especially today, and uh, present to you the various ideas I would like to examine under the rubric of Marxism, anarchism, and the future of the left. Now, how many of you would call yourselves leftists? Can I ask you that? And do be honest with me. Have no fears. I do not bite. In fact, I have false teeth completely. Give me a show, you, and you consider yourself a leftist, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. And I suspect that, uh, that, uh, I'm talking Brooke. About Brooke. <laughs> this is 82 years. <laughs> Brooke, whom I'm very fond of, but no challenge to any of her lovers. <laughs> Um, I suspect that Brooke regards herself as a leftist. Well, I have news for you. I still regard myself as a leftist. For all the battered and bruised disappointments and defeats, I regard myself as a person of the left. And I think it would be a good way of doing what I want to do, to examine as broadly as I can, but more as basically as I can, if that's possible. What is valid in Marxism and what is not? What is valid in anarchism and what is not? And also, what has to be created that goes beyond both of them? Sitting right beside you is a whole pile of white books. And if you read the title, would you please? What is it? Karl Marx and Frederick Engels' Collected Works. I got the whole collected works, everything they wrote that was worth reading, OK? 50 volumes of 47 volumes. And I treasure them. And I hope maybe it'll be donated to the Institute when I die. Uh, but uh, I, I have never found any collection of works that have been more stimulating in my life. There's no one I ever read in my life, including all these philosophers up there, including Hegel, whom I think very highly of, who is my favorite philosopher. There's no one that I think even can hold a candle to the writings of Karl Marx in particular, and secondarily, very secondarily, to Frederick Engels. And yet I am not a Marxist. I have to fight people who call themselves Marxists for 30 years, even more than 30 years. I was very active, first of all, in the 30s in the labor movement. I did not go to college. I have news for you. I did take courses when I came out of the army in 1946. Uh, and I took courses in electrical engineering, electronics as you would call them. But they were still view using vacuum tubes then. And I, uh, other things that I was interested in. And, and then I just essentially dropped in and out of seminars at the new school 
but I did not systematically go to college or get any higher degree than a high school diploma. It's the one thing that saved me. I will be very frank with you. And I'm quite serious. I don't think universities today educate you, particularly in the United States, but I would include today virtually all the European, major European universities. Uh, I don't think they educate you. I think they miseducate you. I think they destroy your writing ability by giving you a format that you have to follow that is highly constipated and is loaded with a footnote for every sentence. Okay? The second thing is, I think that they miseducate you because they're ideological. The bulk of American universities, or at least the most prominent universities, are concerned with postmodernism. Now, does anyone know what I'm talking about when I talk of postmodernism? I don't know how you can escape it. <laughs> but do you know what I'm talking about, more or less? I'll gladly find that. It's after the modern. <laughs> they don't know how to define it, but I'll tell you what it comes down to. Basically, from my point of view, postmodernism is a form of relativistic nihilism. Okay? It is a theory, a philosophical and methodological approach to the desystematization, breaking down the systematic. And that has led a good deal of postmodernists into anti-rationalism. It has led them into an almost chaotic approach of almost anything can happen. It has an effect to try to demolish, but it can't. Whatever is orderly in thinking and in the universe and try to introduce the ephemeral, the accidental, the incidental, the tangential, you see what I'm saying? But the most important thing is it's anti-enlightenment. Now you've got as many different theories of postmodernism as you have postmodernists. Foucault denied he was a postmodernist. I find him the most glib and the most idiosyncratic writer, so I won't get into an argument about this, because he's even declared that he would have been as supporter of the Frankfurt School. And I know the folks in the Frankfurt School, not just that I know their ideas. Marcuse was a personal friend, and others were personal friends. And uh, I uh, solidarized myself with the second generation of the Frankfurt School through one in particular, Albrecht Velmar where we spent hours and days and sometimes weeks discussing. He was uh, the right-hand man of, how many of you have ever heard of Jürgen Habermas? The unforgettable? Okay. So I would take it to the majority of you know what I'm, who I'm talking about. Well, Albrecht Wellmar was the right-hand man of Jürgen Habermas, almost there. And he and I had endless discussions and I tried very hard and I succeeded to some degree, although he would never acknowledge it, in separating him from Jürgen and let him have a mind of his own. But if you want to know about postmodernism from my point of view, you can pick up this book published by Castle or Continuum. Continuum has taken this over and has republished it, all right? You know Continuum Press, are many of you familiar with it? It's, uh, it's a fairly prominent left of center publishing, okay? They left to publish books on Hegel and they left to publish books uh, on all of that stuff, you know? <laughs> Marcuse, blah, blah, blah. And in here, which I think is one of the most valuable things you can read, I try to assess our whole culture in a span of less than three, about 300 pages. And I have a whole section on philosophy and specifically on Pomo, as we who know postmodernism like to call it. It's chapter, um, hmm, chapter seven. And I call it postmodernism nihilism. I think it stems very clearly out of Nietzsche. 
insofar as it has any kind of heritage at all. It stems out of Nietzsche, whom I regard basically as a reactionary philosopher. I'm one of the rare people who does it, however. Since Walter Kaufman laid his hands on Nietzsche, it's become difficult to discuss Nietzsche. Are any of you familiar about these debates in the Popomo world? Any others besides yourself? Well, there's a lot, okay? Your culture has undergone a tremendous upheaval. Up in the upper levels of the people who are, think they're guiding your life and your destiny, there has been a tremendous upheaval since the 60s. Hmm? And it even began in the 60s. Now, I have to work with the assumption that most of you know very little about what I'm talking about, unless I'm wrong, and I beg you to please correct me. Let me know, okay? I want to talk at a level that is comprehensible to most people, but it's impossible to do it to all. Because there are three levels we can discuss this, on the elementary, on the middle, and on the hoch, or the high, okay? And I don't know how to decide to discuss this, you know what I mean? I'm really in a, uh, in a dilemma. So I beg you please to rein me in, yeah? Now, are we getting along okay right now? My point, therefore, is to go through my experiences in these movements, which are partly entertaining, and I think that helps, but which are relatively informative, and I hope that is of some use to you, instead of giving formal lectures. Otherwise, I'd need you here for a year, and at least for four hours a day, three days a week at least, with a lot of reading and a lot of homework and a lot of papers, and I can't do that. Can we understand that? Is that agreeable? Good. So the first thing I want to do is get some water. Will somebody be kind enough to pick up a glass? There's a glass in that uh, cabinet. First cabinet you come to, next to the uh, next to the refrigerator. You got it. And there is the water. The water is in here. The water from the lake is toxic. I wouldn't drink it. Even I wouldn't drink it. The bathroom's at the end of the hall, too. So let's pause for a moment and ask if you have any questions. Can you put that out right next to the... Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to be a very brief preamble to what I'd like to say, if you don't mind. Uh, as you know, I told you I'm going on it. It's f change the speed, that's all. No, we're going to press... I don't I'm, know how you're going to do it. I'm recording you. over something. I apparently... I don't, it doesn't trouble me. It no, it wasn't on. I don't care. Forget about it. Well, that's We've got you on both sides. Yeah, you got me covered. <laughs> Do I, does anyone want to ask a question that will give me a chance to catch my breath? Just one question. We were talking about language. I know, you know there's some anxiety. Semantics? Yeah. Is that what you want to talk about? Well, I just know in, in um, Remaking Society, you talked about um, language and how certain cultures don't even have words to, to own and to have, and I just wanted to know if, yeah. if, if what you thought, do, you, do we need to look critically at our language? Um, at our language today? Yeah. You can develop, spend a year doing that. What would you like to specifically center on? Our language is shaped by our social relations. Marx would have said that, and all I'm doing is echoing him. I mean, there are words that are coming into our language in particular as of this century, the 21st and the late 20th, that are very disturbing. Like, what's the bottom line? Does that bother you? It bothers me like hell. Because that's the language of accounting, of profit and loss, the bottom line. You see? Or I invest in my children. Does that bother you? It does me. Because my children are not an investment. My children are people, my son and my daughter, whom I love very dearly. And I don't invest in them. I give them my love 
and give them whatever assistance I can. Now I can give them relatively less assistance than I did when they were growing up. Now, when I'm talking now literally of the structure of a language and the formulations that it creates, which reflect accurately a tremendous development that has taken place since the end of the Second World War, which is one of the things I want to talk about. I want to talk about where I was when I was young, the kind of world I lived in in New York City, okay, the kind of social movements that existed, the kind of social relations that existed, and what it meant to be on the left. Because what exists on the left today is garbage, from my point of view. You may not agree with me, and I respect your disagreement if you do, if you disagree with me. But I will tell you that what is now called the left is garbage. It's not left, it's not revolutionary, it doesn't know where it wants to go, it's mainly really more social democratic and reformist than revolutionary. In many ways it's even, at worst, it's nihilist in its anarchist form. At best, it is a lot of pompous academic jargon, okay? None of which is designed to challenge the social order, you know? It doesn't mean anything today thanks to the watering down of language, thanks to its reduction more and more to a capitalistic, uh, uh, what's the word I want to use, spirit. Let's use that for the hell of it. The extent to which the commodity, commodity, a very special thing, a product that is made by whatever means for the express purpose of being sold not to be used by the maker, but to be sold by the maker, okay? Cars, wonderful medical equipment, whatever you like, but not to be used as much as to be sold so that other people who need it can use it, but expressly made to be sold. That is what Marx meant by a commodity that has not only what he called exchangeability or exchange of value, it has another thing. It not only is useful so that it can be exchanged and be desired, okay, and it may be useless like a nuclear bomb, okay, but it's made expressly to make money. That's all. To accumulate another commodity called gelt, money, you see, and that money can be used to reinvest back into the production of commodities for the express purpose of ever expanding and ever growing. What you call a society of growth is a society of market relationships in which the exchange of commodities produces profit for the express purpose, not of even being used personally, although it is, but above all, of putting back into industry or into the economy with the view toward it making more money and in the process getting an advantage over your competitor until you com control more and more of the economic field. This madcap growth, this insane expansion of industrial wealth, of productive wealth, does not lead to product, productive, a productive life or a productive society, at least to an ever-consuming society. And the complications that arise from that are, are appalling. They're appalling because industry with rival enterprises competing with each other, each trying to get the better of each other, keep changing the world around turning what is organic into the inorganic, you know what I mean? Pulling steel out of the earth, pulling copper out of the earth, cutting down trees and turning them into lumber, okay? Turning forests, in effect, into planks of wood or paper or whatever for the express purpose and no special end in mind but to grow. If you don't grow, you die. You heard that one, didn't you? Grow or die? I'm sure you did. 
Well, no other society until capitalism came around ever believed, believed in the Middle Ages or even later in the Renaissance. It wasn't believed in the ancient world. It wasn't believed in the Neolithic world. And needless to say, it wasn't believed or was seen as a guiding principle in the Paleolithic, in the lovely world of John Zerzan, which he so admired. And that has gradually, gradually, rapidly, at a madcap pace, transformed the whole organic world. There's no place on this planet now that does not have human footprints. I say it metaphorically, but I mean it. And not only that, <clears throat> there's no place on this planet where you do not have a transformation. And the question is not that there is a creative society called the rational society, guided by reason, so that they will produce, create, fashion a world that is amenable to various forms of life, which we could exist. That it don't mean how bad it is. I exaggerate, but it's close to the truth. They can listen in on anything. They can be, I assume many of you will have children, if not all of you. So, getting back to what the cases are right now, what I would like to do, if this is agreeable to you, is through my own lifespan tell you the world that I knew and the world that you've entered and why this world is so different from the world that I knew. And while the problems have changed, together with the changes, they're going to have to recast things again. And all of uh, the city, I, I, I'm a worker. If I were to look at IWW, how many of you know what the IWW Can one of you tell me what you think it is? Uh, whoever wants to volunteer. What's the difference between syndicalism and anarchism? Be loud. Syndicalism was particular to like a strat a revolutionary strategy of like sort of small gains for the labor movement and for workers um, that ultimately were intended to sort of uh, ferment into a revolution. Whereas anarchism could have a number of strategies and was a particular ideology. Some of just plain silly. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> like painting a lot of graffiti and running away. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you would like to add to that explanation? It's important. It's important. Please. A big part of the syndicalist tradition is that it emphasizes that in the good society, everything would be run by workers, uh, particularly through worker federations. Trade um, unions. Right, right. And that the, the trade union is the revolutionary organization that would then try to take power from the bourgeoisie. And what would it do with the power? It would reorganize the system of production uh, so that workers were able to determine the value of their own labor. Well, what else? I mean, what do I care about the value of my labor? <laughs> I just want to eat. I'm, I'm, not, I'm being playful. I'm not <laughs> being hostile. I beg right, you to yeah. understand. In fact, if I can, I'll show you my dollar bill coin, just to show you that my spirit is in the right place, 1886. 1889. Ah, excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're right. It's called the Morgan dollar. But let's get into it. Go ahead. According to the value of your labor, right. what you put in. Right. Mm -hmm. Please go on. You're doing great, in my opinion. Well, the only example I've ever, any concrete example I've ever read about was like what the CNT did in terms of sort of using the, uh, the union as a sort of administrative body in which um, the gains of labor were sort of centralized and then redistributed the various sectors of that of the union, and so fields in which um, there were there were more there was more revenue, so to speak, um, basically sort of subsidized ones where there wasn't as much revenue, and um, the goods that were produced generally were more equitably distributed. 
point anymore. Why weren't they anarchists? Because it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to exist in the absence of a state. Like a state can still exist, and in fact, in Spain, the state did still exist. Sure did. And that was probably one of the major problems. Well, the anarchists accepted the existence of the right. state. But go on. Anybody want to enrich this definition? These differences are very important. Because you ought to know why you are either one or the other or neither. You should. These were two major movements. They formed that half of socialism, which goes under the name of what once went under the name of libertarian. The right wing stole that. The word libertarian, libertaire, was invented by French anarchists. Elisee de Clou. Okay? Oh, that is really... Just, I'm kidding around with that. That's, that's my plaything. <laughs> it's what won the West. <laughs> but tell me more about the differences between them, anarchism and, and syndicalism. One of the key qualities, I guess, to both is that they were somewhat like apolitical. They weren't. They were interested. In Who was apolitical? Syndicalists. Syndicalists, and, and they were both. That's what they had in common. Right. They were both a, very apolitical, and explicitly. Yeah. Party politics and, yeah. you know, membership in any and they developed right. trade union politics. Right. And I mean trade union politics, believe me. The CNT, Senatistas, went around with guns opposing their own comrades in the CNT when they had a faction fight. I'm not joking. They pulled guns on each other. But Next to Lenin, who made the revolution in Russia. Uh, I was almost personally knowledgeable of him. And I knew people who were related to him and worked with him. And I remember how he was killed by Stalin. Agent. How many of you know remember the Second World War or the Great Depression and the labor movement? Good. It's my job to let you know. <laughs> it's my job. You're not because you're stupid or anything like that. It's because you haven't had these experiences. And above all, you have horrible teachers and you go to schools. <laughs> I really, you must know I'm anti uh, institutional on education. That is one thing I really feel sick about. Because I do not regard schools as arenas of free discourse and free investigation. I regard them as being stages on which teachers can free mm -hmm. and make believe, you know what I mean, that they're, they're persons. If they can't make them in the world, they make it with the young people. Kids who are inexperienced. So the point that I'm getting at, if you please, is we develop a general interest that unites our humanity, namely the welfare of the polis, things of an ecological nature, what we will do in the natural world, because we're going to affect the natural world just by breathing. Not to speak of what we necessarily have to do in order to keep living. There is no such thing as a pure, pristine nature that does not feel the effect of the human hand and the human mind. That is long gone. It disappeared when fire was discovered. And they began to burn the plains, create plains by burning forests. And that goes back to Homo erectus. So let's be realistic. Human beings are an integral part. They have come out of the natural world, out of natural evolution. If you want to know what nature is, it's organic nature, it is evolution. It's not something that is outside human beings, because human beings are a product of the most fundamental evolutionary development. Now, taking all of that together, you develop a general interest. And because you have that general interest, you can form an assembly of people and now try to reason together through discourse what laws, what uh, penalties, whatever you like, have to be passed in order to have a truly humanized and a truly civilized society. And I'm using the word society now just loosely. Strictly speaking, society is a distinct realm that I don't care to go into right now. I've discussed that in detail in this book. Now, when you get to that point, the question is what institutions are you going to form? And how are you going to institutionalize yourself in a world that is irrational? That's what you mean by strategy. 
Hence, you have to form your own polis, as it were, here and now. You have to become political. And you know how I define politics. I define politics today, among other things, it's got many different definitions, but one of the most important definitions it has is the attempt to democratize power. Now, anarchists do not believe in democracy, for example. They believe in consensus. I believe it's idiotic because the silence of minority through consensual procedure in a large group, especially where the people don't even know each other, and I saw that happen over and over again in Clam Show, is to silence the prod, the stimulus of minority mm -hmm. ideas, which should always be there to jab you until whether it becomes a, a, a majority or it disappears, plays the role of create, plays the creative role of getting you to think, of getting you to think beyond the given conditions that you've settled with, and so forth. Long live minorities. They must be cherished, they must be preserved. And that means you have to vote and you have to have majority quotes rule until such time that the minority can win over the majority. It does not mean suppressing anybody. I know of no better way to suppress people than to look for consensus and force them to degrade their opinions until they come to a common level, the lowest common denominator you can think of. And I saw that happen. Now the point is, what are you going to do to begin to make these changes in this world that you live in? We had it down real pat, nice and pat in the last century and particularly long before you were born, beginning with Marx and going up into the Russian Revolution and the Spanish Revolution, 1939. We had everything down real path. We had a working class. It was a proletariat. And then it did everything that it was not supposed to do, according to Marx and the Marxists. And the anarchists, anarcho-syndicalists in particular. It did everything it was not supposed to do. It did not make revolutions, a great myth, the German working class, which was supposed to be the most advanced in Europe, did not make revolutions. It never once voted in the most radical of the socialist parties in Germany. It always voted for moderates, moderate socialists, otherwise known as social democrats. And you've got these social democrats around to this day. It was really part of the capitalist system because one of the most fundamental theories at that time was that the bourgeoisie, the capitalist relations, and the capitalist system would make the workers more and more radical by driving them down into misery. No, it bought them off with the welfare state. Forty, fifty years of welfare state. And it's still going on to a great degree today. I mean, you do have to be very patient to be a Marxist. You then have to wait for the general economic crisis that will drive and drive them down into misery. Like an Oliver, a, a Charles Dickens novel, Hard Times, Oliver Twist, you name it. Okay? Drive them down into misery. Well, we haven't yet come to that chronic crisis. It came to an end with the Second World War and hasn't reappeared. There have been ups and downs. Nobody denies it. Right now, there are 80 million people in the stock market. What is it, 60 million? But this is no small money, you know, part of the population, please. These are people who are invested in capitalism. And they call themselves us worker capitalists, practically. Another oxymoron, or is it? I'm beginning to wonder. <laughs> but you see what is happening. So how are you going to come to people like that, and they have all kinds of variations? First of all, with the appropriate political organization where they can begin to feel empowered. Secondly, with the ideas that will empower them. And how are you going to finally become people who are capable of formulating these ideas, empowering ideas, that will be persuasive to the great, to, to the great unwashed, as they would call it. How are you going to do that? That cannot be to answered with broad philosophical terms like we have to be holistic. People don't know what you mean by holistic. It cannot be answered by general statements about we have to be visionary. We're all for that, even the bourgeoisie. Go to Wall Street and they'll talk about people with endless visions. 
<laughs> it's not enough. You have to be very concrete, just as you have to be concrete when you pass laws. And they're going to be emancipatory laws. You've got to give me a chance to catch my breath because I've been talking well beyond my own speed. Any comments? You want to take a little break, Murray? Yeah, I was going to say. It would be damn nice if we could. Why don't you take at least five? Let's take five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have to tell you about it. I knew him very well. Could you tell us a little bit? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, wait. I would be wrong. Sorry. I don't want to talk about <laughs> So, what I've tried to do is give you the basis for a politics that is libertarian, but not anarchist. Not anarchist in the sense that they don't believe in politics, and as such, in principle, if you are a true anarchist, you don't believe in organization. Those who come around and tell you that for organization are already socialists. Because this organization is very important in anarchy. It creates disorder, and that's supposed to stimulate you. Please let me make it clear. You know, creative disorder? Look at Jackson Pollock and so on and so forth, and art, or, uh, you know, the Marx Brothers in comedy, and I didn't think they were that funny. But they were funny episodes. Creative disorder, you know what I mean? The Wild West, bang, bang, everybody was free. Free to be killed or free to kill. Them. No. I believe very much in order. The highest form of order would be communalism. Now, if you decide that the city is going to be your arena, not that you don't believe in classes, this is another fiction. I've been told over and over again what I think, which means that they don't know what I think. And in most cases, I get this complaint, Bookchin doesn't believe in classes. That's ludicrous. I've been in the working class, I believe in the class struggle, I read the Communist Manifesto beforehand. Many of these people who told me that were born. Not that I'm claiming age over youth, and superiority of age over youth. There is a class. All of these things, many things that Marx had to say are very true. And there are things that, well, I don't know how to sort this out, since Bakunin contradicts himself from page to page. Bakunin has believed variously in municipal elections, that anarchists should participate in them, and then he's come out and said any kind of government or institution is a state. He's believed in creative violence. Violence is creative. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. But he wrote a whole piece on the creativity of violence. And is famous for the fact that he always intervened in situations and said, we have to spontaneously overthrow the system. What happened is that when the Spanish anarchists actually did that, they were not so much anarchists as syndicalists, but still they thought they were anarchists, they didn't know what to do the next day. So guess what they did? They had the power and they handed it over to the bourgeoisie, to the liberals. This was literally, they became the transmission belt for taking the power away from their own workers, their own followers, and turning it over to Luis Campanas, who was the president of the Hanaralita. And I don't care to go into that anymore. I did, I mentioned it. It was one of the most shameful things that ever could have happened, since they should have kept their mouth shut, maybe even Franco wouldn't have risen. But they believe in creative disorder and everything went wild in Spain and Franco used that as an excuse to rise up. He knew what he wanted to do. And let me tell you, he succeeded. He killed at least 250,000 by firing squads in London. It was a horrible story. That was creative disorder. All right, what about creative order? That's what we're talking about, libertarian order. That's what I'm talking about. That's not anarchy, it's the idea of the commune, namely the town, the city, the village, depending upon whatever you want to describe as the appropriate size of the arena. The political activity, and what do I mean political activity? I made it very plain that for me politics is a distinct realm of creating, being creatively active in form, shaping, forming, activating, guiding, and so on and so forth, the polis, namely the commune the community. I don't mean neighborhoods. Please, let me make it very plain. Neighborhoods are still a component of a much larger thing called the city. Now you may decide you want to carve the city down, make New York one-third of what it is, make New York one-tenth of what it is, and make it into ten New Yorks, all separated from each other by green belts. Who knows? 
It's for your imagination to play with, because the time will come and you'll have all the technology you need to be able to do that. As I said before, you must think 50 years ahead in order to understand what's going on today. This is a new kind of thinking. It's not only history that you have to know, but you have to know the future, or at least the direction in which things are going. And then from that direction, you can look back and find out where you are right now, because that's where you're going to end up, or other generations are going to end up. So you have to think of what's going to happen in technology, namely that workers will virtually disappear. Not just that they are not revolutionary as such, which Marx thought they were, and I don't want to get into the whole vocabulary of in sich and an sich and, you know, and an and fur sich, of this whole Hegelian jargon. It suffices to say that potentially he thought that they were always going to be revolutionary, that they were driven to revolution by capitalism. Well, they're driven to capitalism by revolutionaries. That's what I found. <laughs> that happened in Germany in 1990. Tragic. It was the ultra-revolutionaries who drove them toward the Social Democrats because they felt Germans being Germans, with all due respect to them, which I truly have, that one should be orderly, methodical. That's what made them win the large part of the First uh, Second World War, and much of the First World War as well. But the point that I'm getting at is the wrong ends. Now, for that, that constellation of ideas, you have to do this consciously. If it is not done consciously, you're not doing it really effectively. Such democracies as the kind that I'm describing have been built in history. They have been built, but they were not built consciously. They emerged organically, and that can be a limitation. And it's a limitation in the sense that you are, have to work with the assumption that there are internal spontaneous forces that make for order, and that is not necessarily true by any means. There are not necessarily internal forces that make for order that flow out of potentialities and try to replace, in effect, the activity of the human mind. Marx, in fact, had produced the system so absolutely rational and so absolutely logical, however wrong. You can be logical and wrong, you know that. It's very easy to do. You know, you can dream up uh, any kind of notion you want and methodically and very systematically make one follow from the other until you finally arrive at the society you want to create but you'll never produce it, because it has no uh, basis real potentiality. The potentiality is strictly in the mind, than what the mind imagines. You have to go beyond imagination. I don't want to see imagination come to power. I want to see reason come to power. I'm tired of losing revolutions. I'm awfully weary of them. Having written three volumes, the third one is still in the making, on the history of revolutions, I'm bored and wearied and exhausted by seeing how quickly and easily we lost because of stupid ideas. And by how we were working with things that really weren't what they seemed to be. You know, the red flag has been raised for all kinds of things, to stop railroads and to stop riots. As a danger signal or as a, a plea for revolution. And I'm weary of that. And now I want to talk about making revolutions that are real, that are possible not only possible, but necessary, in my conviction. So, I would venture the following view, that we cannot do this if we want to be conscious, and if it's necessary to be conscious, and conscious all along the way, step by step, not to produce idiocies, not to produce failures. If we're going to do that, we're going to have to need a political movement using the word politics in the sense that I have been using, that can go out to the American people and to people elsewhere in the world. We are here in the United States. Stop living other people's revolutions. By the way, this was told to many radicals who came to various countries that I didn't even think were in real revolution, like Korea, which we now know is not, was not in revolution, is now trying desperately to become a relatively bourgeois state understandably for reasons of its own, but I don't want to go into that either. And they used to say to delegations, go home and convince your own people, you don't have to convince us. And that played a big role in upsetting, uh, you know, Lyndon Johnson's plans for the Vietnam War and also Nixon's plans in Kissinger's. 
ditto for any other revolutions. You're not living in Mexico now. I know very nice people, I think highly of them personally, who are running all over the world looking for a revolution, are trying to relive the 1930s or 40s or 50s or 60s or 70s. And that has produced nothing. They've just simply withdrawn from their own struggles. You're living here, and you have to ask yourself, what can you do here with the mindset that you have here? And by the way, in a certain sense, you're very lucky. You're in the most powerful country in the world. But you're also in one of the most regressive ones, unfortunately, because of the backwardness of social consciousness in America. Yet, not so backward that it's going to undo feminism, that it's going to undo many gains that were made by African Americans, that it's going to undo many other advances that came out of the 1960s, including the right to dress the way you do. So please bear in mind that this country is latently very utopian. Even capitalism here is utopian, you know, it's very visionary on how to you know, uh, open a cash register, rob a bank, uh, take it over and rob it, and make it <laughs> feed you, you know. Just look at the hearings that are going on in Washington today. So this country is very utopian. But it is, in fact, utopian. Even its notion of individualism is utopian. It's the idea of the free guy going out with two guns on his hip, as though that's going to mean much in this society and blowing things away, and that idiocy, of course, is a utopian idiocy. No, it's not going to happen that way. What has to be done is that we have to, first of all, and this is very important before I close, we have to look at our American institutions, those that, are, that come out of the American Revolution. The American Revolution was one of the greatest revolutions in the world. And I'm sorry that Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky and other idiots are going around deprecating it. I made a very close study of this American Revolution. Read it in the uh, first volume of uh, the Third Revolution. This American Revolution initiated the committee system that everyone, as John Adams put it in a letter to Thomas Jefferson shortly before they both died, initiated one of the most revolutionary forms that many anarchists and socialists and communists adopted. Committees, popular committees, created not only committees of correspondence, it created committees of vigilance that you never heard of. It created committee forms of government. And it created, above all, in New England, town meeting forms of government. It was an American town meeting conventions in New England that the pace was set for the American Revolution, pushing it further and further and further in a revolutionary direction. So take these institutions, they still more or less creep, crawl, and scratch to the extent that they let them and build them up and give them more life. That's one thing. You have to start from that. You have to speak to Americans in English or in Spanish, the way it's happening in, uh, in the West, in the Far West, and in parts of New York and elsewhere. But you have to speak to them in terms of their own heritage. And you have to enlighten them about their whole heritage. Now, where do we go from there? You're going to start a movement. How do you start a movement? You're going to start with seeds. You're only seeds right now. And I'm going to end with what I want to begin with next time round. You're going to start with study groups. These things, the Russian Kruishki. I talked about this, I know, but only to a select few. The study group which was formed the basis for all the revolutionary parties in Russia, I don't know if you know that, that formed the basis for the American Socialist Party in the good old days, you know, when it was fairly libertarian. Eugene V. Debs' days, in the 1920s and thereabouts, even in the 1930s. Starting with these study groups to educate yourself, and when you educate yourself, then you're qualified to educate other people. Unfortunately, many so-called radicals don't know radicalism enough to be able to educate others. They first have to educate themselves. That means you have to hit the books while you still have the regressive situation that you have today. You have space, time yet. You're not sitting, you know what I mean, on the edge of a military rebellion in July 1936 in Spain, which produced the slaughter, one million dead out of 24 million people. 
Spanish uh, Civil War. You have time, and not only that, you have basic freedoms that the bourgeoisie has the greatest trouble trying to undo. It's not that, you know, laissez-faire. It isn't for not only free trade, for freedom of any sort. It's stuck with these things, and these things are very hard to uproot or to destroy. And you have to fight for these basic institutions that were created by the American Revolution and that have been incorporated into the Constitution, often against the will of those people who wrote the Constitution. Another thing, by the way, that they have done many things, like the separation of powers, which goes back to the days of Republican Rome, are important in preventing fascism in the United States. Bush is now trying to undo them to a very great extent. You have to hold on to what you have so you can take what you have and use it as the basis for transforming society to get what you want. What you have is not what you're stuck with. But what you have is something that you can use as the basis for getting what you want. That's what I'm trying to say. A second thing is if you're going to work in communities and you're going to have a civicist or municipalist or, if you wish, communalist approach, then you have to recognize that you work where you can work, in areas where you still have a way to start, initiate a movement. Things don't roll from the center out all the time, you know that? They often roll from the outside in. I don't think California, please, sets the pace in America. I hate to tell you. I think very frequently small communities that existed in Vermont could have done something if we had people who had the consciousness to do it. These things were possible in other small communities and in other small states. But you have to start somewhere and begin to roll out and start setting examples. And the first thing you have to do is start your study circles, bring what you have from the Institute and what you can get from the books and elsewhere, whatever the sources may be, and start examining where you're at. And one of the most important things you can do is read the history of these revolutions to find out all the mistakes that were made. I, I dwelt on the mistakes almost more than anything else. Instead of giving you the celebratory approach, you know, yeah, yeah, way, way, we did everything great. Except that we failed. <laughs> At tremendous cost in life and blood. But it was great. Okay, I go out and I try to point out the mistakes that all the leaders made. And by the way, you have to recognize in building an organization that you're going to have to accept certain fundamental facts. People are not equal, happily. If they were equal, it would be a very dull world. They're equal and unequal in many different ways. And our job, and HJ Education's job, is to equalize. That is basic to communism, with a small c. The equalization of inequalities. Because given the fact that we're all, justice works with the myth that we're all equal, then you can really get clobbered over the head. Because it happens that the all equal people differ in one respect. Some can get lawyers because they have money and others can't. So believe, don't believe that we're all equal. That's one of the greatest myths. We have to go through a process of equalization. That's part, part of growing up, of maturing. That included me and includes everyone in this room. We come from different positions, different times, different stances, a different world.